remembered. Okay, let me see. I could figure out how to share my screen here again. Is that it? Can you see it? It is coming up in just a second. There it is. Wonderful. Okay. All right. So um, how this is going to work is I have uh, some prompts um, that were put together by Anjak staff. So I will be asking Chris these questions. We are very lucky that we have um, Chris Abrupta, who is, you know, so talented and handsome Stop. and, <laughs> you know, just an all around great guy. Um, and then we will, um, like Randy said, we might not get through the all of the questions, but the sooner I stop talking, the sooner we will get to start them. So um, Chris, do you want to just kind of go over what you know about this, which may not be anything because you forgot you were going to do this today? Yeah, no. So, um, so this is a set of plans that were submitted, I, I, I believe, in Princeton, New Jersey, mm -hmm. uh, 10 acre foundation. Um, it looks like it's um, residential buildings, three cottages uh, uh, with uh, eight one bedroom, five two bedrooms, one three bedroom units, totaling 14 units with 21 bedrooms. Um, and you can see this is the cover sheet that we usually get when we get plans. And it has the, you know, the name of the, of the development up top, you know, 10 acre foundation. That's how you'll refer to it when, when you're in your meetings on the left hand side over here. I don't know. Can you see my hand moving around? Is that yes, we can. Yes. okay? So, so you can see, this is all the, the adjacent property owners here, right? So, um, they have to, they have to notify property owners within 200 feet of the property to let them know um, that there's development going in. And it looks like um, if we can, I can zoom in a little bit more here. It looks like down here, we have the electric company, telephone company, gas company, gas. So as all utilities is over here too. Um, the picture in the middle shows you the zones, right? So the, we're in the R1 zone, okay? And it looks like the R1 zone looks like the line goes like this here and around the property. So. <laughs> It looks like our whole property is pretty much in the R1 zone. The E4 zone is, is next to it. You can see they show the 200 foot radius around the property. You know, that dashed line, that's that's to tell where the property owners are. Um, they have over here some uh, references, information of where all this tax map stuff came from. Um, this is really kind of important over here too, because here they list the permits. Uh, Chris, right. you are getting ahead of me in questions. Would you oh, like to okay. start? So, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. But so, so anyway, so we're going to, we're going to move forward with this and there'll be, uh, there'll be lots of, of chances to kind of look at this and, and pan around. So I've got to get used to panning though. So, okay, there we go. You're, you're doing so well so far. Thank um, you. So Chris, let's start with, um, is the proposed building, which is cottages, um, there's also a multi-purpose building that's on it. Is that consistent with the zoning designation? And can you explain what R1 means? Yeah, so um, we can look at that over here. There's a, whoops, I just moved something. So that information's over here. The zoning table's here, okay? And we can see that that here. So it talks a little bit, I'm trying to blow it up a little bit more. Okay, so R1 zoning, it, it talks about what that is. R1 usually means residential. Um, and sometimes your town may have residential one, residential two, you know, residential three, different types of residential zoning. Uh, so in this table, it tells you what is required uh, under this zoning. So you have what's required by the ordin ordinance in this column here. Okay, so we can, we can see that here. Um, and it talks about lot size, two acres, um, lot frontage, lot depth, front yard, side yard. So um, it looks like we're satisfying all those requirements in here. If you go across and you can see that, well, the minimum lot size is two acres. We have 16 acres. That's great. You know, the lot frontage is 100 feet. We've got 431 feet. Okay, that's good. So you can see how we satisfy all those requirements, except for the ones that are highlighted in yellow. And I think, Alex, you will ask me about that. Is that right? In a minute. I was muted. Um, yes, I believe so. Um, one of the questions is, uh, what are any variances or waivers that are required for this? Right, right. So um, what's interesting here is um, this isn't a variance or waiver, but you can see this is a very important parameter 
when we think about development, we have an impervious cover percentage and you're allowed to have 50% impervious cover on this lot. And we have existing additions is 2.39. And after we develop it to be 6.11 uh, impervious percent impervious cover. So we're way below the 50%, which is great. I mean, so this is kind of, if I saw this development coming, I think that would be the first thing I look at it. Like, wow, that's fantastic. Um, but the other issue here is though they require 136 parking spaces existing. They only have eight proposed. They'll have 55. So they are not satisfying the parking requirement and they would need to get a variance for that. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see. Oh, are there environmental concerns outside of the proposed project area? Well, it's kind of hard to see that on this map here, but there are a couple streams. So that would be my first thing to look at is these streams here. So you got a stream here, right? And you have a stream here, which are adjacent to the property. And, you know, you, you think that, well, they're pretty close. So, so those might be something we would be concerned about from an impact, from an environmental impact, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a tributary to the Stony Brook. Um, and then we have, a, uh, I'm not sure which one this is. Oh, it looks like Mountain, Mountain Brook. Brook. Yeah. Mountain Brook, yeah. So... Yeah, okay. and just so uh, everyone who's looking at this knows, we had a very wonderful ANJAC employee highlight this for us. When you get this application, it is not highlighted like this. So we highly yeah. encourage you to color code however you need. Um, yeah, and I kind of moved the stream here. Let me put it back. There we go. Okay. <laughs> uh, finally, there we go. Um, one final question for the cover. Um, have all required permits been obtained already? Yeah, so that was up here. I was starting to show you that before. Before I interrupted um, they, you. They do, they, do list, they do list permits up here, right? So it looks like the freshwater wetlands um, boundary lines have been verified by DEP. So um, that's your um, letter of, of uh, interpretation, the LOI. So, so that's already been done, right? Um, and, and I guess they repeat it down here again later. So I guess another area had been delineated. Um, I don't really see anything else about permits here um let's mm -hmm. see that looks to be about about it um mm -hmm. they probably do need a freshwater wetlands permit um but they do have that letter of interpretation already done so i don't know are there any more permits on this sheet here i could look over here nope those are all the ones we have that's pretty much it right mm -hmm. okay and uh just so. to point out that um again it's good to have like an eri or an nri because the people who are reviewing this would look up Stony Brook, that tributary, and see that it's a C1 waterway. So it is, um, right. it, you cannot degrade that waterway. So that's an important fact to, to keep in mind. So, and every time you have plans, you have general notes on them, and, and they highlighted some key points here. Trees uh, to, uh, to remain shall be preserved to the greatest extent possible. Uh, all areas where natural vegetation or specimen trees are to remain and shall be protected from erosion uh, by erecting fencing and things like that. So, so you have a lot of cool things in here. No existing slopes greater than 7%. Uh, so they're really, it's pretty flat area. Uh, this thing down here is nice. Um, you're only going to see a few sheets. And when you're on the Environmental Commission, you may only get a few sheets of the plan. But this is not unusual to have 24 sheets of of plans that would come in for a development like this okay and um usually when i get these they're um they're not eight and a half by 11 they're they're 11 by 17 uh so i actually have a uh magnifying glass light lighted magnifying glass so i could read it because these plans were meant to be printed out 24 inches by 36 inches so it's a it's a big difference when you're trying to read it so they're about um a little less than half the size so mm -hmm. okay Sorry, could you go back to the permits that you referred to? Those are the wetlands permits. Oh. Does, does that, uh, on the right-hand side, yeah, does yeah, that yeah. mean that the DEP has reviewed and the development is in compliance with regulations? No, so, so all this says here is that it verified the line. So, so what happens is you get a wetland scientist goes out and they mark out the edge of the wetlands. And then they, they submit that to DEP and they, they come out and they check that. And they write a letter of interpretation that yes, those are the wetland lines. 
And then you have to put in your development and you may encroach on those wetland lines or encroach on that buffer, in which case you would need a wetlands permit. So all this says here now is that, you know, they delineate the wetlands and DEP agrees that the wetlands are where they are. Um, and you still need to get a permit for that. Now you do see down here, um, the, there is a flood hazard area verification approval. So there's a permit for the flood hazard area already. Okay. But there does not seem to be any other permits that they have received uh, in this yeah. in this plan, right? Chris, in the so, notes it says um, it does not indicate on the cover page if the permit is required. So the right. the developer right. didn't put it on there. So we don't know yet if it would yeah. be required. So and that's part of what we do as environmental commissioners. And we had a case like this the other day where uh, they were trying to get a general freshwater wetlands permit for something they were doing and. You know, we insisted that it's probably more than that. You probably need to get an individual permit, which is harder to get, a little bit more complicated. You have to do a lot more work to get it. Um, and that was in our recommendation letter to the town saying, please check and make sure they're going to get the right permit, you know, with this application. So, okay. Mm -hmm. And all of this, all of these permits that they might have to obtain are in the ANJAC checklist. So you don't have to worry about memorizing them. And all you have to do as an environmental commission is say, make sure that they get this, like Chris said. Yeah, make sure they get the permits, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, Chris, next page, we're just gonna show the existing conditions. Um, if you wanna talk a little bit about what you see here, there's no question. Yeah, so so, so this, is, this is pretty cool. Um, it looks like there's a solar array here, which is nice to know. And, and this, this is a great map because you, you may be invited to go out and see this site or walk the site uh, before your environmental commission meeting. Um, so when you go out here, you can see this existing conditions map, you can see the existing features, uh, and this may call something to your attention that, oh, wow, I, you know, I, I, I'm worried about this, I want to see that when I go out there. So for example, over here, it looks like there's some sort of impoundment and a stream right next to the site. So this is that Stony Brook we talked about. So, you know, I, I may want to see how close we are to that, if there's drainage going into that from the site. So I may walk this, this tree line a little bit to check that out. Um, so you can see there, there is an existing uh, bioretention basin in here already. So you do have some existing stormwater management, right? And it's also good to kind of see what's around it. You know, so there's a house here. Um, a lot of times environmental commission, we're looking at lighting situations like, well, you know, are you going to have lighting in your parking lot and, and how bright is it? And it's going to, is it going to blind your neighbors? You know, basically those kind of things. So we worry about those kind of things too. So, um, yeah, so this is just a, a pretty pretty common sheet. You know, we, we see this a lot. Um, it really clearly delineates the edge of the site, too, mm -hmm. which is important. Great, okay. thank you. Ellen, what is your question? Oh. Um, did I see on the um, cover sheet that um, it's a, this is a conditional use, this proposed development for that zone? Mm, good question, the R1 conditional use. Yeah, the, it, it, it may be. So I don't, I don't know. Um, Cause I, so you, then, are, you are building a, uh, it, it's really not a housing development, right? It's 10 acre foundation. I guess it's like a, uh, it's a Christian science nursing care facility. So uh, they, they probably have to get some sort of variance or agreement that they can build it there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it's under yeah. Under their code, um, R1, there are um, some authorized conditional uses, um, which like Chris said, it probably means like, if you ask nicely, we'll let you do it. Um, and one of them is uh, churches and other places of worship. So that's what that means by conditional approval at churches of worship. It's um, that because it's a non-residential use, um, they have to, they conditionally said, okay, yes, you can build a church here as well. So that's a good, that's a good question. And it, Again, it depends on how your municipality does zoning. Um, so, right, so then I think, so then I guess the environmental commission would have to find out what the conditions are and whether they're meeting those conditions, right? Exactly. So it's probably in the zoning or, okay, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, so usually, usually you'll get like a little yeah. write up about the development and it'll, it'll talk about that. And then if I mm -hmm. saw that uh, the night before the, the EC meeting, I would actually go and look up, you know, what is R1 and read right. through that and make sure I understood what that was about. and and make sure this truly is a conditional use that they could could put, do this here and not have to get a whole uh, change in zoning because that, that's problematic. Thank you. Good question, Alan. 
All right, Chris, we are looking at, this is page two tree removal and demolition plan that also shows the existing conditions. So Chris, are there freshwater wetlands and streams on this property? We yeah, about this so <laughs> um, this is kind of interesting. We were talking about this before. Uh, you have wetlands over here. You can see it, and, and this is all the same shading, all these wetlands, right? And you can see there's wetlands uh, here, right? This is all wetlands. And um, there is a, an existing detention basin here, which I'm not sure why that also isn't a wetland, but um, I, I, I'd kind of question that, you know, uh, did you look at this? Because we just had a detention basin in our town that we delineated as a wetland. So that, that could be also considered a wetland at times, depending on what's growing in there. So um, I would question that when the developer came in. Um, so that would be one thing I would look at. Mm -hmm. So. Um, how wide is the transition area boundary for the wetlands and is it sufficient? Well, you can see here, it says here, uh, 50 foot wetlands transition area. I, I don't know if you guys can see that. You know, the TA line going around shows it going there now. So there's different types of wetlands. So uh, this wetland is probably uh, an intermediate value, not exceptional wetland. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. so, so if it's not an exceptional wetland, you get a 50 foot buffer. If it is a freshwater one or freshwater two trout production waters in the area and it would get a, a bigger buffer, it would be about 150 feet. Uh, so that would really change the scope of this development. So uh, ensuring that this wetland was delineated as an intermediate value wetland and not an exceptional value is kind of important. Uh, but like I said, they staked it out and DEP already came out and checked it out and gave them a letter of, of interpretation agreeing that it is a intermediate value wetland. So yeah, so I think the buffer's fine. The one place I'm a little bit worried about the buffer is you got this wetlands here you got the 50 foot buffer around it, but I got a wetlands here. Where's the buffer around that one? I don't see the buffer around that. Mm -hmm. So, so I would question that. Why isn't this buffered? Uh, would be one of my questions. Um, and you see, they also buffer the wetlands off the property. So this is off the site, but there's still a buffer associated with that. So it looks like this wetlands probably goes out further off the page and they, they've got the buffer drawn in here. Uh, so you can't encroach on that, even though wetlands isn't on your on your property. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and what related, else? has the applicant received an LOI from the DEP? And can you talk a little bit about uh, what an LOI is? Yeah. Um, we kind of touched that a little bit already. I don't know mm -hmm. if this, this demolition notes here. So the cover showed that we did have an LOI or, or letter of interpretation, DEP. Basically, an LOI is. Uh, a letter of interpretation by DEP. So as a wetland scientist working for a company, I would go out and I would delineate the wetlands. I would mark it out with flags. Um, DEP would come out and look at it and confirm that, yes, those flags are in the appropriate place. And then we would survey it and locate all those flags. And we put that all on our map here. Um, so um, once DEP certifies that what I did was correct as a wetland scientist, they would send a letter uh, to the town and to the applicants saying that, you know, we approve your your wetland delineation and here's your letter of interpretation. So that's kind of how that works. And I'll give you a hint. Um, it is not indicated on the application if they have received it or not. So that's no, I mean, there, there is some notes on the front that DP has mm -hmm. been out to verify sure. the wetland. So mm -hmm. I, I kind of took that as, yeah, maybe they, yeah. <laughs> they, they have an LOI. You know, if they verify it, they probably did. But that's one question that we always ask when they come in. And if they do have an LOI, usually you get a copy of that as at the Environmental Commission meeting. They they because they, they want to show that off. You know, so <laughs> we did what you told us to do. That's right. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, we'll talk about trees now. So uh, Princeton has an ordinance that requires a tree inventory to be done. Um, there's, uh, says that any trees greater than eight inches in diameter, um, has to be listed. So, uh, Chris, can you see that the, yeah, so you can see this, the whole table of trees here. Uh, so they have all the trees here. They have the common name and they have the, the Latin name. Um, and they, they show the, the age of the tree, which I think they're just guessing at that, uh, the height of the tree, the diameter that is usually pretty accurate. Uh, the canopy is usually pretty accurate, too. Uh, and the health assessment, well, 
this is kind of where some developers I've seen um, try to tweak it a little bit. If they want to lose a tree, sometimes this health assessment here would say bad mm -hmm. next to all the ones with X's on it, the ones they're taking out. So it's amazing how many bad trees they, they're just taking out the bad ones, not the good ones. <laughs> um, and you can see here it says the X ones are to be removed. Um, that's what the X means here. Um, so that's that's it. And you can see on the plan, you know, they they delineate all the trees, right? You can see them here. You know, they they show the diameter of the tree, okay? And they have different styles of trees. Like I, I believe these are the pine trees. These might be the hardwood trees. So they, they show them a little differently, uh, conifers versus uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, hardwood trees. So, so that's, that's kind of what winds up happening uh, uh, with this, okay? Mm -hmm. And so. uh, what else is being removed that you can see? Well, so this is interesting. They, they do have in here a tree replacement schedule, but they do have what they're removing with X's next to it, right? So they're removing this white pine, this Norway spruce, this white pine, this dogwood tree. So they have the X's next to that. And they talk about how many trees they're removing here and the size of that they're removing. And it looks like they're removing 26 trees and they're replacing it with 56, 57 trees. So, um, so I think that's pretty good. Uh, Princeton has a really strong tree ordinance, so they have a, mm -hmm. a ratio. So they're removing an, it looks like an 80 inch diameter tree, so they have to replace it one for one. So removing five of those, replacing it with five. They're removing a 17-inch diameter tree. They have to do two to one, so they're removing 13 of those, replacing it with 26. And you can see so on and so forth with this table here. And you can actually look at the map, and you'll see the ones that they're replacing, the ones have X's in it, you know? And somebody was nice enough to go ahead and put a marker on it. I actually do this myself when I'm reviewing plans. I will have uh, highlighters that will highlight things that I want to note when I go into the meeting. Mm -hmm. So it's it's pretty good. It, it takes me... Uh, a few hours to review a plan before an EC meeting, but I also go through a lot of the stormwater calculations, so it might not take you as long to do that. <laughs> okay. And uh, I, I, I've said this before, but uh, ECs can also have site plan subcommittees. So since we can't all be Chris Abrupta and be experts at this, you can bring um, less than a quorum of your EC together before the meeting to go over something like this. Yeah, we, we have a guy who's great with wetlands. And we have a guy who's great with hazardous waste uh, sites. And we have a woman who's really good uh, with uh, air pollution and, and things like that. So so uh, everybody kind of has a little thing that they dive into. And we have some people who know nothing about the environment stuff, but they've taken on different roles mm -hmm. uh, in, in the meetings and have learned a lot and, and really kind of become specialists on something. So. All right, so I'm gonna move us forward just so we have time to look at the actual site plan. Um, so page three is the actual site plan. Um, and we're just gonna go over some of what we've talked about before. Um, so Chris, can you point out the freshwater wetland boundary and transition lines and if it is being compensated in any other area and what that means? Yeah, so um, this is, I think this is what you're talking about here. Let's kind of zoom in on it here. Um, so you got this wetland here and you had this 50 foot transition line but it looks like they're putting a, it says a checkered block access drive right through the transition area. And it does not look like they're compensating for it. So this has to average 50 feet. So what they could do is they could bring this line in on this side of that road, and then they could bring it out over here to compensate for that. So the area that they lose by putting this road in, inside the transition area, they have to gain it someplace else. And it does not look like they're doing any of that here. Uh, so that would be a red flag for me is, is what's going on right here with that. Now, the other areas, the other wetland areas look like they're fine, right? This looks like it's all outside. Um, once again, um, there is a, uh, I can't seem to go up now. Why can't I do that? Once again, here we have wetlands, but we don't seem to have a tr uh, transition area buffer on here. My guess is that this bio basin is within the buffer of this wetlands. So I'm not really sure what's going on with this wetland. They tend to fill it. I'm not really sure what they're doing because it really doesn't say here. So once again, this would be another red flag for me is where's the transition uh, line for this transition area? And is this basin in that transition area, which I think it would be. Okay, so that's mm -hmm. another another problem. All right, what Chris, else, we're Alex? about to dive into your favorite topic. Well, where is the stormwater that? management and does it meet the new stormwater rules? Well, 
it's hard to tell for the plan whether it, it meets the storm order rules because you really kind of have to look at the calculations. But uh, from what I can see, it, it does meet the requirements where it's close to the source of water. Uh, it looks to be all green infrastructure practices. So these bio basins, I, I would imagine those are rain gardens, right? Bio, bio basins or bioretention basins. So it looks like these blue ones or these purple ones are rain gardens. Uh, these maybe something a little different. I do not know the term bio basin. I'm not sure where they're getting that. So it might just be a stormwater basin. Uh, so that may not be uh, satisfying the green infrastructure requirement. Uh, so I'd have to understand more about what a bio basin is defined as here. Uh, Cause that's really not one of the terms we have in the regulation that was, you can see that in the table I showed you earlier. It's not really there. We do have a lot of permeable pavers here though. This is pretty nice. So, so we do have a permeable pavement here and here. This, these, uh, I guess they're pink lines, pink areas. So that's pretty good. Uh, this area here, they actually labeled it as overflow parking, which is just stabilized turf grass, right? So that's, that's kind of nice that they didn't put anything there. Okay, they got their, um, let's see, what else? We've got, a, it looks like a big bio basin here. Once again, if that's bioretention, that's great. If it's not, I'd be a little bit nervous about that. And then you have the existing one here. Um, the other thing they have here, which is interesting, I, I rarely do you see this, is you have a green roof on the building. So it looks like that might be an overhang in some way, and maybe it's just something to, to kind of look nice, but um, that's another great uh, green infrastructure practice. And then you have another basin here. So, and, and some permeable pavement. So you can see they're spread out throughout the entire development. Um, and exactly what you want to see is you want to see the stormwater management, not just one big basin at the bottom of the hill, but you want to see it scattered throughout the development. So I think this is probably a really great design. And if we went through and checked the numbers or had the engineer check the numbers, I bet you would come back uh, in great shape. Exactly. Yes. We, uh, it's funny when we were picking a site plan for this, we were like, we should give a good example for once because we, we almost always give examples of what you shouldn't do. Um, but you know, this one, while it could be improved, is is pretty good for a site plan application. Um, and then real quick, um, so Chris had pointed out where the permeable papers are in red. So in the purple, you'll see um, the electric vehicle charging stations. So that is the ordinance that, um, or the new rule from the Department of Community Affairs, the DCA that Randy talked about, um, that a certain percentage of electric vehicle, uh, of parking spaces have to be ready for electric vehicle charging. Um, and it turns out that about 30% of the parking locations here um, are uh, EV ready, which is very exciting. Um, all right, so we're gonna go to the next page. Oh, I'm sorry, did someone have a question? Didn't want to talk over someone? Okay, no problem. Actually, I, I, I do, it's Dean. Hey, <laughs> Dean, gave me, that, gave me that pause to uh, mm -hmm. jump in. <laughs> I'm sorry, we should be giving more pauses. Dean, feel no. free to jump in. Sure, sure. Just, you mentioned the EV rule. Does that apply to all types of developments or is it just more residential or retail? Dean, I was really hoping somebody wouldn't ask me that because I do not know the answer <laughs> off the top of my head and I figured someone would. Um, I can, I will do more research and send that to you. That is, it is not my area of expertise, but I can certainly find out for you. Okay. And the other question I have is, um, uh, I know you mentioned um, Dr. Bupta a couple of times about DEP coming in and doing calculations and, and marking off um, the wetlands. If, um, if the applicant is claiming, and this is if this is too specific of a question, then we, we could take it offline. If, if they're claiming a, um, a waiver or an exemption for runoff, stormwater runoff quality because of the motor vehicle surface that's been calculated on the before versus the after, who, who validates that? Who certifies that the before is in fact what they're claiming it is so that the after looks like it's less motor vehicle surface area. Yeah, so that, that would be the township engineer or the engineer who's reviewing on behalf of the township would verify that. Um, and, and that's once again, um, if the town engineer says, oh yeah, you're right, you're fine, you're good to go, and it's wrong, um, and he's wrong, uh, then once again, a town's a violation of permit and a town can get in trouble for that. Now I've seen towns who have just let developers do what they want and not make them comply with permits and DEP's come back and actually made the town go in and fix those developments. 
So the $250,000 it cost to fix the development was not paid by a developer. It came out of um, the municipal tax base wow. because the town approved the development that was not uh, <clears throat> in compliance with the regulations. So, so there is some serious liability associated with that. So, Great. Thank you very much. There you go. Under threat of Dr. Chris Abrupta. You can. There you go. <laughs> All right. Um, so we'll go over the next page because I think <laughs> this is uh, an important one. And then we can pause again for some questions. Um, page four is grading and drainage. Um, this, it, this, I think it says it's the Western uh, part of the site. Um, so Chris, can you talk about what are test pits and why are they important? And do you think the test pits here are sufficient? Okay, so wherever we're infiltrating water, wherever we're putting stormwater management in, we have to have a soil test pit, okay? And sometimes we have to have several, and there's very strict requirements on that. So you can see these brown dots are where the soil test pits were, right? And you can see, you know, it's, it's in the basin. So what they're looking for is how deep is the groundwater table? Is there clay there? Is water really going to infiltrate? So they have it in these basins. They have it you know, on the uh, pervious pavement areas. So um, in reality, they probably should have more of these. Um, they should have one on this side where this perennial pavement is. Um, this one is outside the basin a little bit. Um, so I would hope this would be close to inside the basin. Um, they have some in other places because they were checking, I guess, before they put the development in. So they, they check some extra places. So this one's actually in the corner of the building. Sometimes they'll do that because they want to make sure the soil can hold up the foundation and, and all that stuff. So, so this may be a more structural thing they're looking at here uh, and even here with the road. But yeah, these look like they're in very good shape as, as far as where they put them all. Um, I, I always wish they do more. Um, and more importantly, I, I always look at these data to make sure that um, they have a very good infiltration rate. So if the infiltration rate is at least 0.2 inches per hour, then they have to do groundwater recharge, okay? And anytime they design any kind of infiltration system, the infiltration rate has to be at least 0.5 inches per hour. So those become the two important numbers to remember, 0.2 and 0.5. And don't worry, we are recording this and it will be available. So you don't, don't feel like you need to <laughs> write down yeah, yeah. every single number that Chris says. For now, you should write it down later though. Um, all right, so Chris, let's talk about stormwater capture and outflow. Uh, where are the inflows and where are the outflows for stormwater capture? Well, so let's see. So these boxes here, they have boxes like this and you can see there's a line to it and it gives you an, an invert and an outlet, uh, a lid to 11. So, this is some sort of uh, great inlet grate. The MH here, like, let me see, zoom in on this a little bit. So, you know, see this round circle here, got a label M MH, storm MH, that means stormwater manhole, and it's number number uh, 4D, I guess, and it gives you this surface elevation. They have two pipes going into this manhole. That's the invert in, the invert out, uh, two invert ins and one invert out, so so two pipes are coming in, one is going out. And it looks like this may all be coming down. looks like the water's coming in these areas here and making its way down to this basin. Um, then it overflows and it goes down to this basin. And then it goes discharges out here to the wetlands, which makes me a little nervous, right? So you do have a, a discharge here. And, and how do you know that's discharge? Well, it's got something here called scour hole which is a really a, a hole, big hole with stone in it. And the idea is water comes rushing out of the pipe, hits that stone, slows down, and it slowly flows into the surrounding area, okay? They have a scour hole going into the basin too because they don't want to erode away the basin. But you can see the water's coming in this way and going out this way, okay? And that's really, really important. Um, they have some flow arrows here showing which way the water flows. So from the corner of this building, it goes this way and that way. Uh, it's getting into here and making its way down here. So this is more of a bioswale. It looks like it's moving water from this location down to the bottom, right? And then once again here, you have this fills up with water. 
it goes into this outlet structure, OS's outlet structure, and it goes out to the scour hole and discharges to the wetlands once again. Okay. Um, you have uh, some underdrain systems here. This looks like it might be an underdrain system for the pervious pavement. So water, whatever water doesn't doesn't get soaked into the ground will go into this pipe, get carried to this basin here. Um, and then you have um, some stormwater pipes that are in the street here that would carry water out this way too. So it, it it's really a, a pretty nice system. It doesn't look like it's too many pipes um, that might clog it and it looks like everything's where it's supposed to be. You know, you got to look at the arrows too. If you notice that the, the topo lines, these uh, contour lines, water flows from the high ones to the low ones. So water's always flowing downhill. So you can see kind of how it moves when you have those arrows there. What else? Great, thank you. Um, I'm just going to give a 10 minute warning um, just for our sake. Um, the, we are going to move on to the next page uh, for some very short questions. So this is the soil, soil erosion and control plan on the next page. Um, uh, there are, there's some questions about where are the temporary so soil stockpiles and the proposed sediment control plans, if you don't mind uh, talking about those a little bit. Yeah, so anytime you disturb more than 5,000 square feet, you have to have a soil erosion sediment control plan, and it has to be approved by the Soil Conservation District. So the Soil Conservation District will, re will review these documents and actually write a letter saying that they're in compliance with their regulations. So one of the regulations is you have to have a stockpile of where you're going to put the soil. So, um, so when you're stripping the topsoil off this site before you put the buildings up, you're going to store this, the topsoil someplace. And you see these two mounds are where you're going to store it. Um, they have an SF around it, which is a silt fence. So you can see that line around it, which is very important. And that's so that if the soil washes away or down the stockpile, it's not going to go onto the road. It's going to stay behind that fence. Uh, so you have those two. Um, you have this. They also use a silt fence as your limit of disturbance. Right. So they put it around the edge of the property. So you're not supposed to drive any vehicles on the outside of this and compact that lawn. It's kind of protected. So all the construction, all the work needs to be within that line. You'll also see here you have tree protection. So what they do is they'll put a fence around a tree. It's usually the size of the tree canopy um, so that people don't back into the tree, back onto the roots with trucks, uh, and that protects the tree, and, and hopefully it'll survive after the construction. Um, I see a lot of sites getting built without this. It's very problematic. A lot of times those trees are just going to die because people have driven over them too much. Um, and then there's usually a, a gravel tracking pad here. They call the stabilized construction entrance. So this is a stoned area where um, as you're driving off the site, these big stones will knock the dirt off your truck tires so you don't carry it onto the road. Uh, so that's really, really important. Um, and then they do have some existing inlets here. So this is an existing inlet and they have inlet protection around it. So in other words, they put hay bales around this or they'll put a piece of fabric in it so soil and dirt won't go into this inlet and out to the stream. So these are all the standard soil erosion sediment control practices you would see. Um, very good job. I mean, it looks really like what I would expect it to be. Um, usually the plans look great when they do soil erosion sediment control, but when they install it, that's usually a different story because that black silt fence that's around the property and around these stockpiles, that's supposed to be buried six inches into the ground. And a lot of times you see that flapping in the wind um, and that's not to code. And the soil conservation district should come out and shut down the site until they fix that, so. All right, so we still have one more page, but I wanted to kind of oh pause one more time um, and ask, I know this is a lot of information. Do, do folks have any questions so far? And this is not your last chance to ask questions. So do not worry if you don't. I have a question. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the maintenance schedule because we're looking at all these great plans, but uh, maintenance is what makes it work in future. Uh, the maintenance schedule, should, th should that be part of, the, um, of an ordinance or should it be part of the requirements? So for every stormwater practice, and this is really important now because we're using green infrastructure practices. So for all those bioretention basins and those bio basins and bio swales, 
there is a maintenance manual for each one of those practices uh, that has to be submitted uh, with the plan. So you as an environmental commissioner should see that submitted with these drawings and have a chance to look at that and review that uh, and comment on that. OK, uh, that would clearly identify who's going, who's in charge of maintenance, who's responsible for it. And then every year at the end of the year, the town has to ensure to New Jersey DEP that all the stormwater management facilities in their town are being maintained and working properly, whether they own them or not. So what would have to happen is they would have to get this site to do an inspection of their own practices and write a letter and send it to the town saying that all our, all our practices are maintained, they're all working properly. And then the town uses that letter to send with their package to DEP every year to show that these things are being maintained. Um, sometimes the towns will go out and inspect them themselves. Mostly they're asking the property owner to have a professional inspect them and submit a letter to the town. Uh, and that's been a practice for a while. Uh, without maintenance, you're right. None of this stuff works very well. So Thank it has you. to really be taken care of. Yeah. Thank you. Dean, did you have a question? Yeah, I do. Thanks. <laughs> um, in terms of groundwater recharge, um, especially with larger developments, if there is a dramatic change in the groundwater recharge from the before to the after, I mean, are there limits on how much can be artificially done after a development is put in place? Or Yes. There... So, so the issue with groundwater recharge is there's two issues, right? So you want to maintain what was recharging originally so you don't have additional water running off, right? Um, but you also want to be careful where you put the water back into the ground. And that was one reason they went to doing these smaller green infrastructure practices because people are building these big basins and trying to recharge all the water at that one location for the entire site. And underneath that basin would be underground would be a big mound of water that would stretch out very far uh, laterally and could seep into other people's basements and things like that. So, you'd, so they're very concerned about that. So they have to do this mounding analysis to make sure where the water is being recharged, it doesn't go into any buildings or interfere with any foundations. So that's something that has to be included usually with the infiltration calculations and that mounting analysis to ensure that that's not a problem. Uh, but when you have these green infrastructure practices and you're recharging water throughout the entire development, it's much healthier for that site than if you're trying to recharge all the water at one location. Okay. It's much more Thanks. effective. Okay. Any other questions before we move on to our last page? I, I wanted to make sure Dean got his question answered because he has been reaching out to me about a giant warehouse application that is going into, into Sparta. Um, so I, Dean, I'm very, very happy that you uh, are getting to ask the expert in New yes. Jersey. Yes, <laughs> so am I, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so final page, and then we'll open it up one more time for questions and get you all out of here at 8.30. So we've talked a lot about um, this. This is the uh, landscaping uh, plan. Um, so uh, looking at the plant schedule, looking at the variety, Chris, what are your feelings? Um, and what is well, your assessment? This is where I start first, is I, I look at this plant schedule first. It, it tells me the quantity of plants. It has an ID for plants. So BN is a, a river birch, right? Um, and you can see the it has the botanical name and it has a common name. Uh, river birch and it says multi after, so it's a multi stem river birch, which is one of my favorite trees. It tells you the size uh, 12, 12 to 14 feet, uh, spacing as shown on the plan. And they want specimen quality, so very high quality. Uh, BNB is bald and burlapped, and the other descriptor is multi stemmed. Um, so you can see that all the trees here, and I, and I I like all these trees. Um, they're all native trees. The, the river birch, the paper birch, not much difference than the river birch. Um, uh, tulip tree. I do not know what a cucumber magnolia is. I'm not sure that's a native, but um, flowering peach, bald cypress is a nice tree. So, so these all look to be native trees. I, I, I don't know about the magnolia, but they look to be very native to the area, which is something I always look for. Um, they have some understory trees, which are smaller trees. Uh, they've got the dogwoods, the eastern redbud, the serviceberry, uh, the fringe tree, uh, star magnolia. Once again, they all look very common to the area. 
Um, and then they have some evergreens. So they got pitch pine, eastern white pine. So they don't have any uh, uh, Colorado blue spruces, things like that that aren't really native to the area. So once again, it's, it's, it's a pretty good, pretty good planting list. And I'm sure Princeton does a good job of that. Um, they have a legend here of where things are getting planted. So uh, you can see a deciduous tree looks like this. Conifer looks like this, which we kind of saw before. Um, ornamental planting beds have this hatching. Uh, rain garden planting bed has this hatching. They got a shallow and deep hatching. Um, yeah, so Chris, you were right. Those, I guess those bio, uh, the bio basin things are rain gardens because we can check that on here. Yeah, yeah. So they, they do look like that's what, it, what they are. So now you can go here. On this, and this is like crazy. I mean, these landscape architects, I don't know how they <laughs> see anything on here. Um, but you can see here, um, this is a great example. You know, you've got trees here, two trees here, um, and they tell you what kind it is. Let's see if we can zoom in a little bit more, going blind here. Okay, so these are LTs, both of these. There's two of them here. Uh, this is a QP, so I think that's some sort of oak tree. And then there's a, a PR here. So we can go back and we can look down here at what that means, you know. Um, so the uh, uh, kind of interesting, the Q's not on here. So yeah, you can see uh, it's a crocus, you're right. It's a willow oak. Yeah, so you can see the different different names. Oh, yeah, here it is, QP. So, um, yeah, so you can see the different codes, and that's how you relate to it. So, you know, I I would usually print this out, you know, and I, I would have it so I could go back and look at all these trees and where they're placed. Um, but they're doing a really good, really good job of, of spreading things out and keeping this site vegetated. I, I just think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, they tell there you a little bit about trees over here, too. So I think they're doing a really good job with this. Uh, the one um, the one spot that I wanted to point out, Chris, if you don't mind going back up to near where that legend was on the top left. Sure. Um, so right underneath it, you see where it says bio. So that's one of the bio uh, basins, the rain gardens. Right. Um, yep. They are they plan to put a huge bald cypress in that bio basin. Oh, it may not be the best place <laughs> to put a giant tree in the middle of a rain garden. So uh, bald, bald cypress does does like the water. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a very it's a it's a wet tree and. And I'm not sure is at the bottom of the basin or is there an island in the tree? I actually did a project where we had a bald cypress on an island and we built the uh, the rain garden around it and we left it a little bit higher. And it was really it's a pretty stunning sight. So, yeah, so I, I would question that, you know, why are you putting a tree in the middle of your basin and is that the right place to put it? Um, I, I can understand a river birch would be good for a basin. I use those a lot in, in basins. So, um but yeah, so this is this is good. Great. I kind I kind of like this site. <laughs> if Chris Abrupta is impressed, it's a pretty good yeah. site. So yeah, if I was part of this was this, this Christian religion here, I, I might, might want to stay here. <laughs> <laughs> so we have just about one or two more minutes. Um, like we said, uh, we will be dispersing both the questions that I asked, this recording, and the site plans. So feel free send this to everyone. We also have one from last year that uh, I was very lucky to do with Chris as well of a less good site plan that is on our YouTube channel. So if you want to look at both of those, um, we, you can get two really great examples of site plans. Well, um, this, is the other, this is the other thing they do, uh, Alex, is they, they show up with one of their site plants colored. So they, they ooh, pay somebody to color it, make fancy. it look pretty. And this is kind of what they show when, when they come to the planning board meeting um and they color with with nice gentle colors salt colors so that you know you feel you feel warm about their site and you want to mm. approve it you always know? blue that's the eco color right yeah always there's nothing ne you, they never use red you never see any red in a plan like this because mm -hmm. that's red is bad and evil so you can't have that here so <laughs> but yeah so this is kind of what they always show when they when they show up to plan any board which is nice you know you kind of kind of can see it a little bit easier so all right any final questions all right. I just want to say thank you for all of you for spending a, what day is it today? Wednesday? Wednesday night with us. Um, and especially with Chris, uh, we're about to close in 57 seconds. So once again, thank you all. Thank you, Chris, for joining us. And um, I look forward to uh, talking with the rest of you. Feel free to reach out if you have any additional questions and you will get the recording and all of the supplemental materials in your inbox um, shortly, as soon as we are able to. All right. Thank this you. Is great. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thank Thanks, you. Chris.
Thank you all so much. Take care. Have a good night. Take care, guys. Good night.